Welcome back to Anatomy on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. So in the past few videos, we've been talking about some parts of the inner ear, such as the cochlea, and how that relates to hearing. Hearing is one half of the inner ear's function. The other half of the inner ear's function has to do with balance, equilibrium, things like that. And that's called vestibular sensation. And there's two main parts of this. We have what's called the vestibule, and then the next video we'll discuss something called the semicircular canals. And we'll see that the semicircular canals and the vestibule are used for two different kinds of equilibrium. So here we're going to talk about the vestibule and the utricle and the saccule. Now, there's a few important things I want to clear up at the very beginning of this video that can be confusing when you're being taught this. So you have two terms. You have the vestibule and the vestibular apparatus. There is a difference between those two things. We're going to go to this picture, which we'll see in the next video. So this picture shows three main things. On the left side, we have the cochlea. The cochlea is what we talked about in hearing. That's the organ of hearing. The cochlea is neither a part of the vestibular apparatus nor a part of the vestibule. The cochlea, in some ways, you could consider as separate from those. Now, here we see two organs kind of in the middle. Right here we see the utricle, and then right next to it we see what's called the sacculus, or normally it's just called the saccule. The utricle and the saccule combined make up the vestibule. Okay? So the vestibule is the utricle and the saccule only. Now notice over here to the right of the utricle we have three semicircular canals. Those we're going to cover in the next video. But if we combine the three semicircular canals with the utricle and the saccule, all of those things combined would comprise the vestibular apparatus. So the vestibular apparatus is all three of these combined the semicircular canals, utricle, and saccule. The vestibule is only the utricle and the saccule. The second thing that I want to clear up that can be confusing is that the utricle and the saccule are pretty much the same thing. There is only one major difference that we're going to discuss at the end. It's an easy difference to learn, but the workings of the utricle and the saccule are identical. Okay? All these pictures that we're going to see, they function in exactly the same way, but there's just one minor difference at the very end. Okay? So these two, learn them the same. Now, the two organs of the vestibule, the utricle and the saccule, basically detect two major changes in equilibrium. The first change in equilibrium they detect is called linear acceleration or deceleration. To get an understanding of linear acceleration, imagine getting in your car, turning it on, starting from rest, you're not moving, and then you just go in a straight line, increasing your speed or accelerating, so you go from zero to 60 miles per hour in five seconds, and you're actually accelerating, but you're only doing so in a straight line. That's linear acceleration in the horizontal direction. We could also accelerate up vertically if we got in an elevator. Okay, so you, we obviously know we can accelerate upwards or downwards. So as long as you're moving in a straight line, it doesn't matter if it's horizontal or vertical, that's going to be something that the utricle and saccule detect. Okay? The second thing they detect is they can detect whether or not your head is right side up. So if you're just standing up straight in anatomical position looking forward, your head is in its proper orientation. However, if you take your head or your neck and flex it forward, so basically that means look down at the floor, and you just leave it there statically, you're not moving your head, it's just looking directly downward, you know instinctively that you're not in anatomical position. You know that your head is bent forward. You could do the same thing and you could look up at the ceiling and you just leave your head there statically. That would be a neck extension to look up. And you just leave it there and you know that your head is not in anatomical position. You're out of equilibrium. That's the other thing that the utricle and saccule detect. Okay? We will come back to that, but before we do, I want to explain how the organs of the utricle and the saccule work. The utricle and saccule are termed autolithic organs, and that means they have what's called an autolithic membrane. So there's a layer of tissue right here, and in this tissue layer we have hair cells, very similar to what we had in the cochlea. Attached to these hair cells we have hair tufts. 
These are kind of like cilia, okay, right here. And you see these cilia-like structures or hair tufts sitting out of the hair cell, okay? On the other side of the hair cell, we have nerves or neurons, and these neurons project toward the vestibular nerve, which, remember, is the vestibular division of the vestibulocochlear nerve or cranial nerve 8. Okay, so on this hair cell, one side we have axons that project toward the vestibular nerve, which goes to the brain. On the other side, we have little hairs or cilia. Okay, now these cilia are embedded in something called an autolithic membrane. The autolithic membrane is basically a gelatinous like material, and on top of the autolithic membrane, we have what are called autoliths. The best way to think about autoliths is they're like tiny pebbles and there's a lot of them. And these tiny pebbles collectively have a decent amount of weight, relatively speaking. And so if you change equilibrium, such as raising your head upwards or downwards, or go through some kind of linear acceleration, these autoliths can move back and forth. They can either move to the right or they can move to the left. And when the autoliths move, they're attached to the autolithic membrane, and so they pull the membrane in the same direction. So if the autoliths move toward the right, they're gonna pull the autolithic membrane toward the right, and as a result of that, that is gonna move the cilia, or the hair tufts, to the right, okay? The same argument we can make if everything moved toward the left. And then, depending on which direction these hair tufts move, left or right, they'll send different signals through these axons to the vestibular nerve, and your brain will detect those. Let's get a more concrete understanding of this. Here's your head in the upright anatomical position. What you notice here is that the autoliths are attached to the autolithic membrane, and then those hair tufts are embedded in the autolithic membrane. But since there's no disturbance of equilibrium here, the head is completely upright, no acceleration, no bending of the neck or anything like that, we see that the hair tufts aren't being bent at all. Okay? Now, imagine that this person performs a neck flexion. So that means they look downwards to some extent toward the floor. So in the picture, this woman is bending her head forward. Now, when you do this, you automatically know instinctively that you're no longer in an upright position. Your head has tilted forward. And so when the head tilts forward, these autoliths are going to be moved in the direction of the force of gravity. So if she tilts her head forward, the autoliths are going to move forward due to gravity. And as a result, the autoliths are going to move with them, the autolithic membrane. And if you notice, these hair tufts are being pulled in that direction also. The opposite would be true if she tilted her head backwards. If she tilted her head backwards, we'd instead of have a different picture where the, where the autoliths are actually moving toward the left, pulling the autolithic membrane toward the left, and then also pulling these hair tufts toward the left. Okay, So this is an example of what happens when your head is just simply not in equilibrium. It's not an upright position. It's either bent forward or bent back. So A, B, and C right here on this slide are just different looks at what we got on the previous slides. A right here is again with the head in the upright position, what we saw right here on the previous slide. And notice that the hair tufts, or there are certain kinds of cilia that we won't really go into much detail about, notice the cilia are not really being moved in either direction because we're in equilibrium. But notice that the axons are firing. They're firing just at a baseline level. Okay, they're firing at a baseline level. This is what's called tonic activity or resting activity. So it's not that the axons are not firing at all, they're actually firing a moderate amount. Okay? Because notice what happens when we perform head flexion. Uh, just like we saw here where the head is bent forward, we see that the autoliths and everything else with it are moving in the direction of the tilt. And so in this case, these cilia or hair tufts are being bent toward the right. Whenever these hair tufts are bent toward the right, what we see is that the frequency of firing of these axons actually decreases. So anytime these hair tufts move in the right direction, at least in this picture, or we could say they are bent anteriorly, the rate of firing by these axons is decreased. However, in C, when we perform a head extension and we move the head in the opposite direction, say look up at the ceiling, 
everything else is moved in the reverse direction toward the left in this picture or posteriorly. And so when these hair tufts are moved in the posterior direction, what we see is that the rate of firing of these axons actually increases. And so depending on the rate of firing of these axons, that will tell the brain which direction the head has been bent or whether or not we have head flexion or head extension. All right. Now letter D right here, this is what I was getting at with linear acceleration or linear deceleration. So here's how we're going to imagine this. We have a car, we're starting at rest, and this is more pronounced if you're the passenger because if you're the driver you kind of brace for this, but if you're the passenger and someone starts from rest and they just slam on the gas and accelerate, what happens to you? You kind of move backward into the seat, right? So imagine a car that's accelerating toward the left, and imagine you are the hair tufts or the cilia. So if the car is going to accelerate towards the left, that means you are going to be thrown to the right because you're thrown back in the opposite direction into the seat. Okay, so when you accelerate to the left linearly, that means you or the hair tufts actually move in the opposite direction. And so in this example, when you have linear acceleration to the left, the hair cells move toward the right, that's going to translate to a decrease in the rate of axon firing toward the vestibular nerve. Okay, and also note that linear acceleration to the left is going to have the same effect as head flexion. The opposite is also true if we were to accelerate toward the right. If we accelerate toward the right, then the hair tufts would actually be moved toward the left, and we would actually see an increased rate of axon firing to the vestibular nerve, which is the same thing that we would actually see in head extension. Okay, um, And linear deceleration works the same way. If we were actually decelerating in the left direction, if we were decelerating in the left direction, that would be like we were going 60 miles an hour and then somebody slammed on the brakes. What happens when you slam on the brakes? Well, you actually move in the direction of the deceleration. So if you were decelerating to the left and someone slams on the brake, you move toward the left. Okay, you actually move toward the windshield and that's why we have to wear seat belts. And so if you were decelerating in the leftward direction, then the hair cells would also move in the left direction and we would have an increased rate of firing. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now all the stuff that I've just talked about with the autoliths, autolithic membrane, which is this gelatinous mass, the cilia, and the direction of bending, and the rate of firing of axons, pretty much all that works exactly the same between the utricle and the saccule. But what's the major difference between these two organs? Well you can see that difference here in this picture, and it has to do with their orientation in Cartesian coordinates. The utricle, it turns out, is actually oriented more in a horizontal direction. It's not perfect, but it's more horizontal. And so as a result of that, the utricle is better able to detect horizontal acceleration, so acceleration in the left and right direction. So basically, when you're in a car and you're accelerating or decelerating, the utricle is able to sense this. Okay. The saccule, on the other hand, is oriented more in a vertical direction, and so the saccule is better going to be able to detect vertical acceleration. And this is pretty much just like when you're in an elevator going up or down. The saccule is going to be more detecting that movement, whereas the utricle would be more or less detecting horizontal acceleration. And really with head flexion and head extension, there's actually going to be some overlap between the utricle and the saccule. All right? So, hopefully this makes sense, and let me do a brief recap of everything that we've talked about. Okay? Both the utricle and the saccule are autolithic organs, meaning that they all have autoliths situated on top of a gelatinous mass called the autolithic membrane, and depending on the direction of movement of the autoliths, it's going to move the gelatinous material or autolithic membrane in the same direction and move the hair tufts or cilia in that direction as well. And depending on which direction these hair tufts move, you're going to have different rates of firing of these axons. And remember that these axons all lead toward the vestibular division of the vestibular cochlear nerve or cranial nerve 8. And the major two things that the utricle and saccule detect is they detect changes in linear acceleration. Remember, that's like if you're driving in a car and you accelerate or decelerate or if you are in an elevator and you're going up or down, which involves acceleration in the vertical direction. 
And then the second thing that these organs detect is really just changes in the position of the head. Are you looking down? Are you extended upward looking at the ceiling? Or are you just have your head upright in anatomical position? Okay. The key with the organs of the vestibule is they do not detect rotational acceleration. This is all either static equilibrium or linear acceleration. If we want to look at rotational acceleration or rotational equilibrium, we have to then look at the semicircular canals. The nice thing about this that we'll see is these actually function in a pretty similar manner to the vestibule, that is the utricle and the saccule, but the major difference here is that these semicircular canals are going to detect differences in rotational equilibrium, and we'll cover the semicircular canals in the next video. All right? But other than that, hopefully this made sense to you and you learned a lot. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.